Go ahead and have a seat. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. I uh, have gotten lots of questions about my retirement. And uh, knowing this church as I do, I felt as though if I got ahead of the curve and made fun of myself, you would stop. So anyhow, I have a joke I want to read to you, and uh, it so took me off guard when I read this, and it has a couple of words in here that um, are not sanctified, let's put it that way. But um, I want to read this to you so that you'll get an idea of uh, don't send me any funny cards about retirement. <laughs> All right, three old men are talking about their aches, pains, and bodily functions. One 70 year old man say, I have this problem. I wake up every morning and at seven, it takes me 20 minutes to urinate. That's the unsanctified word. <laughs> An 80 year old man says, my case is worse. I get up at eight and I sit there and grunt and groan for half an hour before I can finally have a bowel movement. That's the other unsanctified <laughs> word. The 90-year-old man says, at 7, I urinate like a horse. At 8, I go like a cow. So what's the problem, asked the others. I don't wake up till 9. <laughs> that had the proper effect, so you all know where I'm going. Well, here we are, at the end of one chapter and the beginning of another. One chapter ends... Another one starts. Uh, I've never been good at saying goodbye, so I won't start now. This dynamic of transition brings both the bitter and the sweet, the good and the hard, but that is life. Hopefully this talk will allow us the privilege of celebrating the past and give us hope and faith for the future. First and foremost, I want to honor God who's given us the privilege of serving this congregation for the last 26 years. There have been so many people, and you just have to understand, if I started to say thank you to all the people, you know I'd leave some out. And so I just want to say to everyone, thank you, who have bought into the vision and have put their shoulder to the wheel that have allowed us to be where we are today. Uh, but the one person who deserves most of the credit is Cheryl, my wife. And, uh, yeah, would you give that... Up to her. She's given so much of herself to this church over the years. Uh, as many of you know, this has not been an easy time for Cheryl and myself in our marriage or in our relationship. We want to thank you for your care, prayers, and support during this most difficult time. Over the last 26 years, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, who have put on the serving talent, served in the church. You know, the church just can't operate without volunteers. And volunteers are not just come, some kind of special people. They're the ones that give their time and their resources that actually make the church happen. I want to take us on a video tour of this last 26 years. Um, if a, a picture is worth a thousand words, then this video is going to be worth uh, a whole bunch. So I just want you to, to look at this video as we look, uh, look at what happened this last 26 years. A few months back, I had the privilege of sharing uh, congratulations to Dan and Cheryl for 25 years of ministry there in the Grand Junction Vineyard. And at that point, I expressed how strongly I felt about your church. I, I've, I've seen its uh, vibrancy, I know its history, and I know that over the past uh, 25 years under the leadership that it's grown, and now it's a church that has very significant impact in Grand Junction and throughout that part of Colorado. You're now going into a transition, and Kirk and Jane are going to be coming into leadership. I think you've made a good choice and I want you to know that the entire vineyard is going to be praying for you, uh, praying for Kirk and, and uh, Jane as they assume the leadership, 
and believe that God has good things in store for you. It's always painful to have transition and to uh, move from leadership that you've known so long and then into uh, a new leadership. But I know that God is with you. He raised your church up and so he'll provide you the direction into the future. May God richly bless you. May God's blessings be upon Kirk as he, and may he be filled with wisdom and filled with the Spirit as he uh, begins to assume the responsibilities that uh, he will assume as leader of your church. God bless you.
That's pretty cool, isn't it? I'd love to have a guy like John James around. You are one of the most creative people I've ever been around in my life. The church has done remarkable things, and I'm not just talking about buildings, obviously, and land. We've sent hundreds into short-term missions, and some into full-time work. It's important for me to say to all of us who have a career and support others are as valuable as those that go into full-time. And I really want to make a distinction here, and you've heard me teach on this before, is that you can really do, and let me back up and say this, the extremities of the body, because Paul makes such an analogy in the scriptures about our physical body and the body of Christ that we can actually do without the extremities of our body. You can live without your arms. You can live without your legs. You can live without your nose. You can live without your ears, and you can live without your eyes. But you can't live without your liver. You can't live without your heart, and you can't live without your kidneys. All those things that are unseen. And I think what happens to us lots of times in the church is that it becomes about the extremities and not about the people that really are the vital organs of the body. And that's to most of you that you're the real important ones. Uh, we have only, not only sent our most precious resources, which is people, we have sent hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. If I remember right, this last year, we sent over 400,000 to missions. It's incredible what this church has done. Yeah. We have given both to the world, and we have also touched our own community. We're known as the church that is everywhere in the valley, but we're also known, now listen to this, as the Protestant church in the valley that cares about the poor. That's a great legacy. We've watched as God has raised up so many people who have taken on responsibility in different ministries, all for one purpose, and that is to see lives changed. And we've seen hundreds, if not thousands, of lives changed. Now, I don't want to get real cutesy here, but you know this uh, little outline... Five wishes I have for you. I really do, and I want to go through these tonight. We're going to go a little bit over, but oh well. <laughs> uh, five wishes I have for you. Number one is this, that you would know God for yourself. Let me, let me share this scripture from 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 9. It's Paul talking here. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. I mean, in each one of us, there's treasures God has placed there. To show us this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are pressed on every side. You ever felt like that? Pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. The reason why I chose this scripture is because it really does show the ups and downs that Paul goes through in his life. And he's confused. He doesn't understand. But he knows that God is his anchor. There's a characteristic of personality that is called a God consciousness. This dynamic of personality tells us, now listen to this, intuitively that there is a God. Some people consider their conscience enough where they don't believe it, but originally when God created each one of us, there is this uh, God consciousness, which really says this, man cannot think past a first cause. I mean, you go back to your parents, and you go back to your grandparents, and then you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, and we can all understand where we came from. But the ultimate question is, where did God come from? And so there has to be an uncaused first cause. I love what Francis Schaeffer said about this years ago. He said, it's the absolute of wonder. You know, most of our minds can work in the future of going ahead and understanding that there is no end, and it's very more adaptable for our minds to accept that than it is to go backward into history and to try and understand that God never had a beginning and he always was. It's very difficult. But that is called the God consciousness. And every one of us have a God consciousness because we understand intuitively, that there is something bigger than us and that there is an eternity. Now, as a young man growing up, I just want to say this to you. I had lots of questions about God. Numbers of questions about God. Now that I'm at midlife, <laughs> I hope you were getting, going to get that. Uh, now that I'm at midlife, I recognize 
I have as many questions now as I did when I started. Now, let me share this to you. Every one of us here at some time or another have had people that have spoken into our lives. And as they have spoken into our lives, there is a reality of who God is by the mere transmission of this thing called preaching or teaching that settles into our hearts and we get a concept about who God is. Now, I know this has happened to every one of us in the room. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us to judge what is being said. And so when something comes out of a person and you go, you know, something in here just doesn't sound right, there is probably a discernment. And actually, what is going on is this. Should I believe that guy or that person up front, or should I believe my own intuitive feelings? Now, in that point right there, friends, is a tension. You and I have a tension that we have to deal with. And I can tell you exactly what I did as a young man. Often, I would just take what that person had to say. Even when the pill would go down in a really bitter way, I would take what that person has to say, but it it dialed something up in me that that's not right. I just want to say this to you. It is absolutely necessary for every one of us to discover who God is for ourselves. To be one with God is not necessarily so much as what we are together. It is what are you like when you are by yourself and you're all alone and you're wondering, who is God? That's the question that every one of us have to answer. And my wish is for you, friends, now hear this clearly. My wish for you is that you would not group think, but you would know God for yourself. Understand this God that leads us and guides us and protects us and does all these things, but not just because somebody has said it, it's because you've experienced it for yourself. So that's my first wish for you. Number two is this. Remain flexible. And boy, the older you get, the harder that one is, isn't it? The rigidity of any person or organization could be its strength as well as its own worst enemy. The epitaph of many organizations or individuals could read, we have done, we've always done it this way or we've always thought this way. Now here's something that every one of us need to think about. The truths that we hold near and dear to our hearts, now listen to this, need to be prioritized as absolutes and relative truths. Now I know that I'm skating on thin ice, but I really don't care. I want you to hear something that I think is really True, if I can just find this one piece of paper. Here it is. That lots of times when we go through the scriptures, what you're going to find out that there is going to be a specific truth to a specific people for a specific time. But it is not an eternal truth for everybody at all times. And you and I, lots of times, will say every word in the Bible is true, and it is absolutely true, and I'm not here to argue that at all. But it does take a temperament or an understanding to try and understand, is this truth for all time. Now, I'm going to give you this, this illustration here. Now, this is out of Deuteronomy 23, and this is about the children of Israel. And this is God speaking to them about what they're supposed to do with a certain deal. Listen to this. Designate a place outside the camp where you can go to relieve yourself. It's kind of a theme tonight, isn't it? <laughs> As a part of your equipment, have something to dig with. And when you relieve yourself, dig a hole and cover up your excrement. Now, can you believe that? I have used the word excrement right here in church, but it is in the Bible. So argue with the Bible. Now, what God is saying here is this. As a matter of fact, if you go on, it's kind of funny. Because God says, I am a holy God, and I'm going to walk around your camp. (laughs) You get it? You know? Now... What we have to determine is this. Is this an eternal truth for all time, or is this a specific truth to a specific people at a specific time as they're journeying through the desert? And all of us would have to say, it's just a truth for that time. Because if you would say it's an eternal truth, and every one of you that have indoor plumbing are in sin. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? There's a a dynamic that goes along with this. When engineers were trying to discover ways to break 
the sound barrier, when they were trying to go through the sound barrier with aircrafts, what they found out is that they kept destroying aircraft. And they would go back to the drawing boards, and actually pilots were kind of getting upset about this too because their fate was in it as well. And what they discovered was is that they still tried to make the structure stronger to go through the barrier when, in fact, when they understand or understood what the uh, sound barrier was all about, they designed flexibility into the aircraft itself, and it was able to absorb the shock waves, and it was, could go through the barrier. Flexibility. Flexibility. You know, I've, I've asked this question lots of times to us. Um, how many of you still believe the same things that you believed two years ago? See, there's probably lots of changes that go on in our hearts and in our minds. What does that tell you about the things that you hold true now? And see, here's, here's the thing that I, I really want us to understand, friends, that lots of times when barriers come to our life, you have to discern for yourself which of those truths are God-inspired that are going to be your anchor that's going to get you through that difficult time and which ones you need to relax on. See, I, I'm finding out the older I get, there are very few hills I want to die on. When I was younger, boy, you could have named a hill and I would have died on that hill. The older I get, the more I realize, and, and, and I'm over, going to oversimplify this one by a long ways, and there are other truths that I would die for, but this is the one that I would take a bullet for right now, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And that is something I will never give up as long as I have breath in this body. You know, and it just comes to this place, friends, I just beg of you, remain flexible. Remain flexible. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. What dynamics are going on in your life? Number three is this. Take risks. Take risks. We all know the phrase, you can spell faith, R-I-S-K. There's something inherent in all of us that have a need to risk. I, I saw this years ago. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the gambling society is doing so well is because they have understood this dynamic in people. You're either going to risk it in the right way or you're going to risk it in the wrong way, but you're going to risk it. Every one of us have a need to risk it. I've noticed the older I get, the more my mind switches from risk to security. You ever notice that? Uh, we had a ministry here. In the, in the church, and I, I think it's starting to come back, and it was called Craftsman for Christ. And uh, there was an issue that came up with this ministry, and it was about liability. And the liability issue was this, is that when we sent out a team and they went on a house and began to prepare or work or whatever they were doing on the house, and let's say the worker was on the roof and he fell off, who would assume the responsibility of his injuries? And so, you know, I was at that time thinking about the assets of the church and thinking, you know, maybe we never uh, need to back off of this, this ministry just a little bit until we can get it all cleared up. The guy that was ahead of it at that time, his name was Gene Hewitt. And he came up to me and he said, uh, you know, Dan, I've heard you preach that you can call faith R-I-S-K. Why aren't you practicing it? You know, you just hate that when people repeat <laughs> what you've taught. And I mean, it was, it was almost like, uh, you know, one of the most clear moments I've ever had about the decision. You got to learn to risk it. You can't stop risking it. My wish for you is that you would never stop risking it. At age 55, Colonel Sanders took his refined recipe of fried chicken and began to sell franchises. You know what they called fried chicken? The gospel bird. I, I was going over this point Thursday, and I was thinking about fried chicken, and you know what I did? I went and got some. <laughs> and it's, it's good. But at age 55, here's a guy that has been working on a recipe, and he believes in it. So he goes out, and he begins to sell franchises. At age 65, he has over 600 franchises. And I, I, I just want to say this to you. Uh, 
You know, I know that it is inherent, again, as we get older, is to try and take away the risk factor and begin to move towards more security. And for this church, I hope you never, ever come comfortable with where you are. But you will take the next risk that God asks you to step out in faith and do. And that's the way that God has worked for us for the last 26 years. I wish that for you. And you know, when you go back to what Colonel Sanders did, and I know that this was just one of those kind of examples, but it is something that illustrates to us that people are willing to take risks for financial gain and for careers. If that's true in that arena, then it should be true for us. That when it comes to the kingdom of God, be willing to take risks. Take the step. Seems to be that that's where the fruit is, at the end of the branch. Number four is this. Be the church in the culture. Be the church in the culture. This church has an incredible heart for this community and declares it every week. In some form or another, Pastor Bob is out there uh, with his teams, and so many of you are doing this and feeding the poor and uh, feeding kids and going to schools and all the rest of it. It's just incredible. John Wimber, who was the founder of the Vineyard, Bill Hybels and Rick Warren, and I want to talk about Wimber for just a minute. Um, these guys had such a vision for unchurched people. Um, still do, although John has gone on to be with the Lord. Bill and Rick still have an incredible vision for unchurched people. And what they were saying was this. Uh, we need to create a place within the church that is for unchurched people and not just for churched people. One of the things that really attracted me to the vineyard, and especially to, to John Wimber, I wished you could have known John Wimber. John was a, uh, he was like a big Santa Claus. He was a really big guy. But he just had a warm personality that just disarmed everyone. And he was, a, he was an authority figure to a lot of guys that were a lot younger. And basically, as I understand it, and the way my... my uh, uh, coming into the vineyard, really looked at it, is that he contextualized the church to the, to the culture better than anybody that I've ever been around. He was the first man that really said, um, I'll give you permission to have a band. Now, I want you to think about this, friends. 25 years ago, to have a band in a church was unheard of. I can remember the first time that I ever heard drums in a church, and I thought the thing was going to fall down. And I was a young guy. I was like, what is going on in here? And then to have people up here that are, are playing these kind of instruments and then knowing this was happened 25, 26 years ago, and then somebody that would actually get up and preach without a suit. I, it was a traumatic experience, and I'm not overemphasizing that word the first time that I ever preached without a tie. It scared me. You know who scared me the most? My mother. <laughs> I thought, what is she going to think? You know, the idea of what we were trying to do, and understand this, friends, we were trying, and those people were trying to create an environment that we could bring our unchurched friends into so that they would feel comfortable, so that they would have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And the relevancy of the vineyard, just the way that John talked, you know, he was the first preacher that I ever heard really talk about God in a one-word syllable. There's only a few preachers that can say God and make it two syllables, but they can do it. You know, he talked in a normal voice. He, he allowed you to be casual. He allowed people to come in casual. And there was just this transformation that took place within the church of saying, okay, we're going to create a place within the church that it's okay for unchurched people to come and try and understand what their mindset is. But I have to say this to you. I think we're still a little bit short. You know, I think we've really got it as to what it is, and we need to continue to develop the idea of what it is to bring unchurched friends to church so that they can hear the gospel and they can experience what we do. And so we do this thing of gathering rather well. But I think where we're having some problems is this, the church scattered. 
is understanding that the commission that God has given to us is not just to be the church when we come together, but it is to be the church wherever we are. You know, Jesus gives the example of salt for a reason. We are the salt of the earth. As a matter of fact, he even goes on to make, kind of develop a whole story out of this. He says, your salt should never be trampled underfoot. In other words, in my, in my estimation, what happens to this, lots of times, is the church becomes a uh, clanging cymbal or a noisy gong that nobody wants to pay attention to. And so therefore, we are relegated to something in society that people don't even recognize as the people of God. But salt has the ability to touch something and preserve it. Salt does absolutely no good six inches away from any piece of meat. It only has relevancy when it touches the meat. You see? And that's what he has called us to do, friends, is to touch the culture. For one reason or another, the church has alienated itself from the very thing that Jesus was sent here to touch, and that was the world that was going to hell. And you'll find out that through the scriptures, he is always making contact with the down and outers. Aren't you glad that he fished on the bottom? You know? That that's what he says, I want you to do. I don't want you to be a light that is put under a bushel. And for one reason or another, we lose the contact. We lose what it is that God has really called us to when we go out there. And that is just engaging the culture. Engaging people where they are. And sometimes I think the the foreign mentality that we have in the church is a bigger barrier than what the mentality of the unchurched have towards the church. And for us just to go back into the culture and saying, you know, God, I'm going to trust you to lead me. And let me touch somebody's life. Let me be the salt. Let me be the light. Um, I want to share this example. Uh, because it really kind of says it for me. Uh, you know, we do this thing at the 4th of July, and it's called Freedom Fest, and, and Pastor Bob and Brad and all these other ones do an incredible job, and it takes, I think we had 200 volunteers down here this last 4th of July. And we have to go through this process with the city of trying to get the proper uh, permits to do it. And it's becoming more and more of a hassle. And so Nate Ralston uh, was talking to me about it one day, and, and, he, and he just, this, this is why I love these young guys around, is because they always kind of pull you out into areas that you really haven't thought about. And he said, you know, Dan, they can always stop a big church, but they can't stop an individual. You know, and, and something about that just, you remember that, Nate? Just wrong, so true to me. So, you know, here's, here's what my suggestion to you is, is that if next year, they won't permit us to go down there and do Freedom, freedom Fest, then what I want you to do is I want you to take your barbecue. <laughs> this is not a hard thing for this church because I know you like food. <laughs> and I want you to go down to the park and I just want you to set up your barbecue and start cooking hamburgers and see who God brings to you. And just be the salt there. Just be the people there. You see, and, and then it's, it's you know, I mean, when you go back and you look at the New Testament church, friends, uh, they didn't have a whole lot of big programs. You know, I, and I thank God for the stadiums that give, I thank God for churches like this that are filled, and, and I thank God for the big things. But you know how people come into the kingdom of God? One at a time. When you look at the New Testament church, that's what happened, is that people just shared where they were, and people started coming in because they were the salt. They were the light. They touched the culture. Number five was this. Support Kirk and the team here at Canyon View. We've talked about a fresh wind that this church will encounter during this transition. And I want to say prophetically to you something. The best days for this church are still in front of it. The best days are still in front of them. 
There's something about the laying on of hands that symbolizes transference. Jesus healed and blessed and commissioned with the laying on of hands. Paul, Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that was given to him by the laying on of the hands. I want to call uh, Kirk and Jane up. This is our new senior pastor and his wife, Kirk and Jane Yamaguchi. So welcome them. Yeah, amen. Love you guys. Love you. Uh, as you can see, Kirk is about the same size as I am. And <laughs> Anyway, I want to call the pastoral staff up. And uh, we're going to lay hands on uh, Kirk and Jane. Yeah, you can, you can sit down if you'd like. And uh, here's what I believe is going to happen, friends, is that there's going to be, because this thing is of God, that there's going to be a transference, transferring this leadership to Kirk and Jane and to the team that's here. And we're going to believe God. And when I pray here in just a moment, I'm going to ask you just to stretch out your hands. And as we stretch out our hands, we're going to believe that, uh, you know, the next phase of this church and where God's going to take it is going to be mightily blessed by what he's going to do uh, in all of our lives. So maybe you did stand. No, sit, sit still. Just reach your hands out and let's, let's pray. Open it. Thank you, Lord. God, we, uh, we recognize that for whatever reasons you raise certain people up and you've raised Kirk and Jane up for this place. And Lord, the uh, example that came to me this afternoon as I was thinking about uh, this moment was Elijah to Elisha. And uh, Elisha asked for a double portion. And you know, Lord, that two means so much to me. And I ask for a double portion upon Kirk and Jane. Lord, a double portion of your spirit. And that, Lord, this uh, transition phase, uh, that they would find favor, not because of who they are, but because of who you are and because your hand is upon them, that there would be favor upon Kirk and Jane as they take over the reins of Canyon View. We bless them now, Lord, for what you're going to do through them. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I've asked Kirk to say a, a couple things. So, Kirk, you guys can stay up here. If you want. Worship team, you can come up, too. Holy cow. <laughs> One thing we definitely need here is a metal worker who can cut... Maybe four inches <laughs> off of Ooh, this thing because these guys can't see me. <laughs> Maybe that's good. Well, we are, we are deeply humbled, deeply humbled to be here with you all. <laughs> Thank you. I fall, fall off and break my neck. We are deeply humbled to be called to come to Canyon View. And many of you may not know this, but this was our church home from 91 to 95, and it was in those four years that God really uh, awakened something within me. And uh, shoot, <laughs> I didn't want to do this. You'll see that I do this a lot. But we do feel like God's calling us back to our spiritual home. And uh, we deeply love this church. We love you guys, and we want to serve God. We want to be good stewards of what God's doing here. And we want to continue to be the people that servant, our servant leaders to the staff and to all of you to help this church to continue to truly make an impact in all of Mesa County. So thank you very much for your warm welcome. We feel very blessed to be here. You guys have extended yourselves very graciously to us. And uh, we are looking forward to what's ahead and what God's going to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's stand together. You ready? Let's, let's worship the Lord together. Well, I was going to let you
you guys sit down. But uh, stay standing. We're not going to worship. It's kind of like Dan was saying. Uh, we just need to just do something a little different here. Um, you know, he's, I've been blessed to be part of this. And uh, the fact that uh, Dan and Cheryl, along with Dave and the uh, rest of the staff, took a chance. Okay, no tears this weekend. So no mushy songs. But uh, what I do want to say is this. Dan and Cheryl Cox are a blessing. And just because this is the last weekend um, doesn't mean that we stop being their friends. Doesn't mean that we stop reaching out and making sure they're okay, being their friends. And, and the transition, that doesn't happen all the time. As a wise man once said, uh, towards the end of your life, you count your friends on one hand, your real friends. And uh, Dan, I hope I'm on your hand. So I thought I wanted to do something nice. And I thought, I'll wear a Bronco jersey this last weekend. <laughs> and I cast that demon out pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the next worst thing or best thing I could do? I picked a country song, I think. So, <laughs> so yeehaw. Here comes East L.A. and country, so hang on.
You would think that the last song that Ronnie would play would not take a jab at me, but the loss of the keys and being towed was all about me. So anyway, I, I want to invite Kirk back up and have him pray a blessing over you. And uh, I think it's just important for both of us to understand, I mean, for all of us to understand, but especially that you see that this is a unified thing. It's something that God's doing. So Kirk, would you bless the people? Father, we pray that through your mercy and by your grace that you would come and that you would release your spirit on every man, woman, and child in this place. And as they go from here, that they would go knowing that your love overshadows everything and every obstacle in their life and that you go before them, you protect them from behind, and you are hovering over them with your protection. And just go now in the blessing of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless Amen. you. God bless you. God bless you. See you. Thanks,